Hello, lovely people. Wow, you said hello back. I'm so freaked out. That's great. <laughs> it must be Friday, and it must be 3, and you guys must be drinking beer already, is what I'm thinking. I never get anybody to say hello back to me in Norway, which is fine, because you all are just quiet, which is good. So I'm going to talk today about computer science stuff, theory, because I figure, you know, it's the last day of the conference, 3 o'clock. I'm sure your brains are right there and ready to go talk about computer science theory. I think it'll be fun. Um, I, I like this stuff. And if you sit with me and have a beer or we're having some coffee or whatever, I will invariably start boring you to tears with theory stuff because I love it. I think it's exciting. Uh, and a friend of mine uh, stood me up the other day or a few months ago and said, do you really actually ever think about any or use any of this crap or do you just talk about it? And I said, that's a really good, uh, that's a good question. I do. I use it every day. And so from that discussion came this entire talk. I want to point out that I don't have a degree uh, in computer science. I have a degree in geology. And I'm actually not here to debate whether a degree is needed for computer science stuff, coding, programming, developing. That debate is something I don't really care about. But what I do think is I think knowing the basic skills that go into computer science uh, are very useful. I use them all the time. I use them every single day. In fact, I was just coding something as I was sitting in my hotel, hotel room today, and I was like, I think I can make this order log n if I try. Yes, I'm going to talk about Big O today, and hopefully I won't put you to sleep. But if I do, uh, it's a cure for your insomnia. That's a good thing. A few years back, I decided that I needed to fix my geology only degree situation. So I decided that I wanted to go and find out what it takes to get a degree in computer science. So I went to MIT, I went to Stanford, uh, I went to a few other colleges and just basically cross-referenced their curriculum and saw what subjects that people studied. And I dove in. And a lot of these colleges put their curriculums online. So MIT has MIT Open Courseware, and you can go and, and watch lectures from some of the top minds in the world, such as uh, Eric Domain, who's one of the leading uh, people in complexity theory. If that's, your, if that's your thing, why not? So I did that. I wrote the first book, and it, was, it proved to be quite popular. I had a good time doing it. And I decided to write a second one all about binary and where do we get information theory from and so on. For the second one, I was joined by Scott Hanselman, which was a really fun time writing a book with him. Uh, and so that's, that's how I got here. That's how I know all this stuff. And, uh, to be honest, I've spent the last few years just focusing on nothing but this stuff, so it's top of mind, but it's cool because I get to use it during my day job. And I work at Microsoft, and I focus on a few things. One of them is doing videos to help people learn Azure. And to do those videos, I have to think up and dream up some fun and interesting examples, and then we record them. And I do this with my colleague, Burke Holland, uh, if you want to see what I do. Um, I also have another site that I, I created called azx.ms, if you're an Azure person. And you need a script. I created a little utility that will go and grab a script. Say if you need Postgres spun up on Azure, uh, this little utility will do that for you. Uh, the reason I'm telling you all this is I like my job. I really have a good time uh, doing these things because I get to make stuff. Um, my focus in my group, I work in the CDA group at Microsoft, my focus is on open source, non-Microsoft uh, ecosystem developers. I have a focus language, which is Elixir which means I get to figure out how Elixir can run happily on Azure. And more than that, I'm fascinated to find out how I can get the VM, which works in a distributed way, how can I get a distributed VM cluster uh, working on Azure? That's one of the things I'm focused on. So what I decided to do, and this is just a few weeks back, I decided to put together an Elixir cluster and have it talk to Redis. And uh, I wanted to see like, how hard that would be, and then I was going to do a video about it. It's still in the works. Because there's a lot to think about when you do this kind of thing. Now, if there's Erlang fans out there, you might be thinking, why use Redis? I mean, Erlang handles all that, blah, 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 which is true. Um, I did it because I like pain, and it's fun. But the neat thing is, as I was putting this example together, I found myself face to face with some core computer science concepts. And I just thought, this is the weirdest thing. I had to start thinking about data structures and big O. I had to think about complexity theory as I'm putting these samples together. I actually sat there and said, I think this problem might be NP-hard. I'm not sure. And uh, I just wanted to punch myself in the face at that point. But it was, uh, it was, <laughs> it was pretty funny. So before, before I kind of 
gave this talk, I gave this talk in NDC London. Before I gave this talk there, I said, I showed it a few slides to some friends of mine, and they said, you know, Connery, you're going to get on stage and people, you're going to lose people, and they're going to think you're just kind of strutting around and talking about how much you know based on the book you wrote, and they're going to think you're like professor now. And I really hope that that's not the case. I don't want you to think I'm standing up here like I'm some egotist and I know everything. That's not my goal today. Likewise, there might be some folks in the audience who might look and say, this stuff's obvious, man. Why'd you drag me in here and take me through CS 101? I'm hoping we can go right down the middle, and I'm hoping you feel that I have enthusiasm for this stuff because I think it's fun. I think a lot of the stuff that you're about to see is probably going to make you roll your eyes. Uh, thinking back to your computer, uh, maybe your uh, job interview years ago that you hated, uh, thinking about the state of interviews today and the interview questions that people ask, I would ask you to please challenge yourself and let's geek out because there is so much fun in all of this. So let's start at the very beginning of the story, which is data structures. And as I mentioned, I was working with Elixir and working with Redis and I needed to come up with an example, uh, something that I needed to think through and I didn't want to do some hello world kind of thing. And, and I decided, okay, I'm going to use Redis, but whoa, Redis uses What's this uses all kinds of different data structures. What, uh, what's this choice that I have? I don't quite understand. So data structures, if, you don't, if they don't jump to the front of, front of mind for you, it's things like arrays and linked lists and dictionaries and just basic stuff that you have to study when you go to do an interview. Uh, if you're a, a C Sharp or a .NET person, those would be linked lists, sorted lists, list of T, all those kinds of things you have to think through. Those are data structures, but at a higher level, not the basic stuff. Redis, on the other hand, is kind of weird. Redis allows you to store data in a particular data structure that meets your application's needs, which is weird, because if you use a relational database, you have one data structure, and that's a table. You've got rows and columns, and that's it. And you don't have to think about it. If you use a document store like MongoDB, you have a JSON document. That's your data structure, it's, uh, and that's all you got. But with Redis, you get things like lists and sets and sorted sets and strings and hashes and bit arrays. Now, some of you who work with Redis, you probably think, yeah, yeah, I know what that is. Others who are like me, who just use it for caching, <laughs> you don't know what any of this is, just use a string, who cares? So I was making a shopping cart because that's what I do. I don't know, it's just what I know, and so I decided I'm going to use this as an example because it's just hard enough without burdening the thing I'm trying to do with Elixir. And it's interesting when you're confronted with Redis and you want to store your shopping cart data in it, uh, what do you use as a data structure? You know, I didn't know, but I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I wonder how closely these align with the things I've been studying. As I mentioned, in Redis you have lists and sets and sorted sets and strings. What does that even mean? And hashes and bit arrays. So I had to figure out which one of these would be the right thing to use for my shopping cart solution. So in order to figure it out, I need to know what that shopping cart's supposed to do. It's basic, nothing much. I have to do CRUD, create, read, update, delete. I have to do unique key lookup on the shopping cart, be able to pull it out of the database. I have to loop over all the items in my shopping cart, and then I have to find individual items in a cart quickly. Simple stuff. So when you're using Redis, what you do is you come up with a key. It's a, it's a key value store, but the value is going to be some data structure that is going to define or going to be used for your data to store your data. So you define your key in typically this way. You do some general term, colon, some more specific term, colon, some unique key. Now, this can vary based on what you need to do. So I decided to go ahead and come up with this key, and then I said, well, I'm going to start with a list because I have a bunch of items, right, that it's in a cart. And it seems reasonable to me. So I went to the documentation, and this is taken from the documentation, that a list is a collection of string elements sorted according to the order of insertion. And that yellow highlighted bit Doink, went off on my head. They are basically linked lists. Now, I know what a linked list is. I didn't know what a linked list is a few years back. I had no idea. But a linked list is basically you have a node that has some data, points to another node, another node, another node. That's a linked list. It's pretty easy. So I'm thinking to myself, linked list, OK. Why not? I can probably make use of that. But then I look down below at the methods that you need to use with a linked list. LPOP, LPUSH, RPOP, RPUSH. You know, to a lot of you, you might recognize those methods straight off. If you don't, there are methods that you use on a stack. You push something onto a stack, and you pop something off of it. And then I thought, what's the L and what's the R? And that's left and right. So you can left push 
onto a stack, and you can left pop. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you left push onto a stack and then right pop, that's a Q. And I only know this, again, because I just studied all this stuff. So I'm looking, it's like, this has nothing to do with a linked list at all. And so I decided to update the documentation, <laughs> for myself at least. These are more like stacks and queues. And I just, for me, that was, that was really a useful insight. Because if I would have just believed that this was a list of strings and you know, sorted according to insertion, then I would have just been like, all right, I'll use that. But then I started thinking, this doesn't make any sense because I don't need a stack or a queue to store shopping cart data. So just for fun, I decided to take it for a spin, write some code, see if I was right about that. And you can see here, I have L push and then sales cart robbed. I just chose that, that as my key. And then I just put in a text value of SKU1. I pushed that onto my, onto my uh, list and I pushed SKU2. And then I decided how hard is it going to be to get stuff out. This is where Redis is pretty cool. It gives you all these tools for pulling things out, putting things in. You can cross-reference, slice, dice, do all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, so I just did L range, give me the range between 0 and 1. I was able to get things out. All right, well, this is weird. L range, 0 to 100, I don't get an error. I don't know, this just doesn't feel right. So I moved on from there, and I felt good about that decision. And so I thought, well, let's try a set. And I'm being honest here, I, I, I know of Redis, but I never dove into Redis to this level to think about how to store my data. A set, you can see the definition there right under the title, a set is a collection of unique, unsorted string elements. I could probably use this to store some cart data if I thought of the cart data as JSON. So let's just try it again. You can see s add or set add. I'm able to add two things, and then I'm able to pull it out with the uh, command s members. So now I can loop over stuff. So this is feeling better, plus it's unique, and I like that. So this is what the solution might look like. I just take little items, and I turn them into JSON, and then I pop them in to the, to the set, and I'm good to go. I can pull it out, and I can loop over the data. So this, is, this was starting to look like my solution, but I have a problem. And that problem is a pretty intense one, because I need to get to an individual item. Let's say I want to update the quantity, or delete it, or whatever. I need to be able to get to it, and the only way to do that is I have to loop over everything. Right? I pull it into memory, deserialize it, loop over it, and that's just really not very efficient. So finally, I settle on a hash, which if you read anything and you've Googled this by now, you probably already know it. Conrace is obvious. You should know this. Uh, if you ever have to store structured data, you store it in a hash. And a hash is simply in a key and a value. That's it. So you can think of a like, JSON document, key, value, that's a hash. So this, this solved my problem. I just do h set, and then I have my cart key, and then I can do a skew as the key for my hash, and then the value, which is a JSON dump. So as you can see here, this is a solution that I came up with, and it works great. So I'm able to get at each individual item in the cart just by sp specifying the queue, and then I can do get all and get all, all the items in the cart. Hooray. Problem solved. So I just used a lot of words. I just used a lot of words to describe what I was doing. And if I was sitting on a code review with my manager and trying to explain all of this five years ago before I had the understanding of what a data structure is and the way of talking about complexity of algorithms and time and so on, I would have just probably sat there and waved my arms a lot and said, this is how it's going to work. And I think it'll be good because we can just go right to the thing we're looking for. What I've been talking about right here is my choice of data structure within Redis, but it could also be within code somewhere. I chose to use an array in C Sharp instead of list of T because I have these reasons. What are those reasons, and how do you communicate those to your other developers or to your boss or to anybody, really? And this is where I need you all to take a big breath because we're going to talk about Big O. And the reason that, that I wanted to bring up Big O is because, for me, it has just been so nice to get all the jumble of words out of my head when I think about this stuff, and I can say, oh, yeah, it's order in, and leave it at that. So what am I talking about? Big O, as I mentioned, is a, is a concise mathematical way to talk about the efficiency of the stuff you're doing. That's pretty much it. So in this case right here, when I have uh, a single key that I'm trying to get with my hash in my, in my Redis, uh, in my Redis uh, table, then all I need to do is do h, h get, as you can see, sales cart rob, and then the skew. Boom, I have it. I have one operation. That's it. One operation that I'm doing. And it's on the order of one operation. So a shorthand of that is order one. It's the fastest and the best big O you can have. This is important stuff because this tells another developer who happens to know Big O, it tells them the efficiency of your algorithm. And they can instantly have a picture in their mind, if they understand Big O, they have a picture in their mind of, oh, wow, that's cool. You only had to do one thing to get to the data that you wanted. 
Now, another way to think about this, and a lot of ways that you'll hear uh, people talk about order one is constant time, because one is a constant. What that means is, no matter how much data I have in my cart or anywhere, I can have millions of records. I still have to do just one thing. I have constant time lookup. It will never change. Uh, so that's, I'll come back to that in a bit. With my set, when I had to pull things out and loop over the items in the cart, that's a lot of operations that I have to do. I have to loop over each item and I have to compare the SKU, or maybe I have to deserialize the JSON as well. So that's an operation per item in the cart. So if you're sitting there talking to, talking to somebody and say, what if you have 100? What if you have 1,000? What if you have n items in the cart? What's the efficiency of that? Well, I guess it's on the order of n operations or order n. Now, I'll skip over this lame explanation uh, that I'm trying to go through here, and I'll just tell you, just look for loops. <laughs> That's my key. That's my trick when I'm doing this. If I'm trying to figure out how uh, efficient an algorithm is, just tell me how many loops I got. So in the first operation here, I don't have a loop. There's no loops at all, so that's order one. I know that. Uh, there's one loop to try and loop over my cart items, so that's order n. Simple enough. But what if I'm doing something a little bit more intense here? What if I screw up, let's say, and I used a set, and I was deserializing my JSON, and I was just dumping stuff in there, feeling like I'm a hero, because I know the strings are unique in a set, so I shouldn't have any duplication, except if I have differing quantities. And whoops, I now have duplication in the cart. How do I dedupe my cart? I've got to pull the items out, right? This is an interview question 101. You've got to pull the items out, you've got to loop over each item, and then within that loop, you're going to loop again. And then you're going to look over all the other items to see if you have a duplication, right? Compare the SKUs. That is a classic interview question. And if you do a loop within a loop, you have to loop over n times. And inside the loop, it's n times n times again. That's order n squared. So right here, I've gone over just the basic problems that all of us face on every single day when we write code. Believe it or not, you fight this battle all the time. Order one, order n, order n squared. And for some of us, it might be a good thing that we have to think about this with Redis. I like this stuff. But for others, they might say, what are you doing that for? I mean, I can hear what you're thinking. Like, it's close to the middle. And for some people who want to squeeze out as much efficiency out of their system as they want or as they can, then they're going to use something like Redis, where they can tweak all of this stuff and really, really think about it. Now, again, I, I, I like to talk to my friends and go over with my slides and tell them what I'm up to. And, I uh, give them a chance to make fun of me. And they invariably say the same thing. Why would you use Redis? Why would you do that? Just use, like, I have a friend who's a Django person. Just use Django. Django's arm is really good. You don't even have to think about this stuff, right? Or uh, my friend John Galloway, you know, any framework handles all this kind of stuff for you. It does stuff under the hood. It optimizes things. I don't need to worry about that stuff. Like, OK. You know, and I kind of think that's like his opinion, man. I mean, that's great. You can rely on your arm <laughs> and have a good time with your arm, but I kind of think that you still need to think about this stuff. And this is where people kind of look at me and just say, OK, great, are you going to do a theory dump on me right now? And as a matter of fact, I am. <laughs> this is Ben Cull. I love Ben Cull. He comes here usually every year. He's Ben who likes beer. I love his, uh, his, his Twitter handle there. Who here has wrestled entity framework trying to figure out what the hell is going on and why this query is slowing down. I'm sure so many people, it could be Entity Framework, I don't mean to pick on EF, it could be anything, where you just start out well-meaning and you end up with a query that looks like this. And you end up on Twitter asking people, what do I do to make this faster? <laughs> and I'm not trying to make fun of Ben, I promise. But the first thing that my brain locks into is, what's the problem? And the problem is, that he's got a bunch of data in the database. And it worked just fine maybe a year or two ago or three years ago. But as time has gone on, the, da the database has gotten bigger and more and more records, it's slowed down. Why is that? Well, it's because he's clearly having to loop over every single record to satisfy this query's condition, which is a problem. And when I say loop over every, I know, boop, order n. So he's got an order n problem in his query. We need to get that down. Can we get it down? That's where my brain instantly goes to. Can we get this down? Well, yeah, we can use an index, right? And that's what Ben's trying to do. He's, how do we use an index? Well, my brain doesn't like just saying, let's throw an index at it. I want to know how fast we're talking about. What are the performance gains? Because if I put an index on this, I'm going to need to know it's actually going to do something and not just kind of stumble along. So let's dive in, shall we? 
You ever ask yourself, what does an index do and how does it work and what's the time complexity of it? <laughs> well, that's why you came to my talk, I'm sure. This is an EF query, and this is a sample database. Um, I'm calling it ChinookDB. I have DVD rental stuff in there. It doesn't really matter. What I'm doing here is I'm looping over a bunch of silly test data. I'm not looping over it, excuse me. I'm querying a bunch of silly test data to pull out a title, Academy Dinosaur. So when I run this query, EF translates this SQL into, or translates into roughly this SQL. It looks a lot different than this, but let's just pretend, right? It's just doing a simple equality query. Great. So if we're using Postgres, we can tack on the keywords explain, analyze. And explain, analyze will tell us the query plan, and the first words that you see there will cause DBAs to jump off a cliff if it's on a record set that is constantly growing. And what that's telling you is this is a sequential scan. In SQL Server land, it's called a full table scan. And I'm sure if you've ever sat across from a DBA when they're breathing fire at you, you've heard the words full table scan, bang, bang, bang. This is bad, especially in a table that's growing and you're doing a text match query condition like I have here. My brain says this is an order n. I know we can do better because we can throw an index on here. So that's what I'm doing with this. And again, this is Postgres. So to th uh, throw an index on here, we just say create index, give it a name on this column, on this table. Now you can see we're doing an index scan. Yay. And you can look at the numbers to the right to figure out how much more efficient this is but those numbers, admittedly, from the Postgres team and others, even the SQL Server team, are just kind of, well, they're just guidelines. They don't really tell you how it's going to perform under load. I need to know something a little bit more specific. I want to know the big O, right? Don't you want to know the big O? I do, because databa database indexes are radical. And I, and I mean that in every way. They're radical, they're magical, they're a bunch of other wonderful adjectives. The reason why is because if you master them and you know them to a level where you can affect your project and speed things up, you are a god. I promise you that. It is, it is going to make you indispensable. So let's dive in a little bit deeper. When you create an index, it is likely going to be a B tree or some kind of binary index in the background. Uh, SQL Server default is that. MySQL doesn't have any other kind of index. Postgres has a bunch you can choose from, but by default, it'll throw a B tree index down. What that's doing is it's pulling the data out of the table, and then it's sorting it in this index. It, that's all it's doing. It's sorting it alphabetically. That's all it has to do. And the index just sits there. When you query it, and Postgres sees, ah, I can satisfy, or any database see, uh, engine, I can satisfy this query with an index. Boom, I'm going to do it. What it's going to do is it's going to use an index scan as opposed to a full table scan or a sequential scan, and it's going to divide that index in half right in the middle. And it's going to have a list for A through M, and it's going to have another one N through Z. And it knows it's looking for an A because it's got the first letter right there in front of it, and it knows to satisfy this condition, I just need the top half. And then it's going to split that further, and it's going to go from uh, A through F to uh, God, my eyes, G through M, and then so on. It's going to keep on splitting, keep on splitting, keep on splitting. And I know that when a lot of people hear about this, they go, why would it do that? If it knows what, if it knows it's Academy Dinosaur, why doesn't it just take all the A's and then take all the C's and then A, C, A, D, and then work its way down to the bottom? The interesting thing about that is you don't know how the data is structured in the database. I could have 900 rows of records that start with A, and the only way I know that is to scan every record in the database. This algorithm right here is actually much more efficient. We finally get down to the very, very last item, and the last item is going to be the exact one we're looking for. This algorithm is called binary search, and it's something you have to study when you go interview for a job. <laughs> And uh, the way it works is you start out with a bunch of items. Let's say here it's an inverted binary tree. As you can see, I have, let's say, eight items. So if I split that list in half, I have four. That's two squared. Uh, then I have two. That's two to the one. And then finally, the last one's two to the zero. This is logarithmic. And if you think in terms of exponents, whatever, you say something's exponential, it's squared, cubed, whatever. If you go in the other direction, <laughs> that's logarithmic. That's the way I think about it, at least. Who cares? What does this mean? Why do I care about logarithms? Because now I can actually get some numbers. I have a thousand rows in my table. So before when I was doing a full table scan, it was an order n scan, so I know I have to do a thousand operations to satisfy that query. But now, since I'm using a binary search, it's log base two of a thousand. Why log base two? Because it's binary. And I have a thousand total items, so 10 is my answer. 10 operations to pull out the number or the, the record I want. That's cool. 
I mean, isn't it cool? That's powerful to know that. And you can sit at the table with your DBA and say, oh yes, I've got an order of magnitude, uh, or actually more, uh, efficiency gain. In fact, I took it from uh, order n down to log n, and that makes me radical. <laughs> uh, I don't know, do you guys say that to your, I, it works for me. You should go ahead and do that when you go back to work. So that's using an index. That's how an index scan works. That's our efficiency gain. And this is the fourth and final big O I'm going to go over. No, that's not true. This is fourth of five that I'm going to go over. Um, here's a little bit of trivia for you, because I'm a database person. When you do a primary key lookup, like let's say this is on our films table, select star from film or film ID equals one, who here thinks, well, who here knows what the big O is on this? Is it a single operation? Think sing who thinks it's a single operation order one? Anyone? All right. It should be, you've got a primary key, but if you ask Postgres, no, it's not, it's an index scan. The best you can do here, the best you can do here, believe it or not, is a log n. Isn't that crazy? I thought that was crazy. Postgres, a uh, little caveat, Postgres actually has a hash index that you can use. Um, theoretically, it's, it should be faster, because if you use a hash index, it'll actually go order one to go get the record. Uh, in practice, however, uh, most databases like Postgres and other ones are so highly tuned. There's so much going on in the background that you would not even notice the performance gain uh, from this, uh, or you wouldn't notice the difference, I should say, between an order one lookup and, and a login. Why do I bring all this up? Because I want to come back to Redis, and I want to talk about why people love Redis so much and why they use it to improve the speed of their application. So what if we had to query something in Redis? And this is where Redis sort of falls down. You saw before I could use a hash to have an order one lookup, one operation to get something that I wanted. What if I had to search, let's say my product catalog within Redis, I want to search for a, a product by a given name. Uh, and here you can see I'm looking for a silver pen. Well, the only thing I can do here, the only thing I can do is pull all the records into memory and loop over them because there's no query facility inside Redis. It's key value only. That's a problem. If you try and take Redis to production as your only database and someone's like, you know, your developer's like, well, I wrote a query, I didn't know how to do it, so I just am looping over all the, and no, that's going to be bad. And you're likely going to get in trouble. I mean, I know if you're using, if you're using C Sharp and .NET, and let's say you're using um, a sorted list, and you want to get one thing and you do first or default, is that going to improve this? I don't know, do you know? I'm, that's your homework assignment. The way you get around this with Redis is you create your own index. And you create a special, you create a special uh, table for it. And in this case, I'm going to use the key sales uh, catalog name index, boom. And this time, the value, or excuse me, the key is going to be the value that we want to search on, silver pen. And then what's going to return is the SKU. So this is a common practice in things like Cassandra and Mongo and other things. You create these indexes that help you query. Do we get an efficiency gain on this? So this is JavaScript right here. This is some sample code. Right? You can see I'm pulling the SKU out. I'm just doing an async call. I'm pulling the SKU out. Uh, I'm getting the SKU from, from my index, and then I'm using that SKU to query now the catalog. So I've got two things that I'm doing here, and this is highlights one of the problems if you're so focused on thinking about efficiency in Big O. Is this a better solution than just looping over the entire catalog in memory? Anybody have a guess? This is still constant time. You can still consider this order one. Uh, even though we're doing two things, we're doing two database calls, it's still considered order one because it's constant time. It's a two. It could be a three. It could be 10. It could be 100. As long as you're not looping over the inputs and the, and the efficiency of your algorithm has nothing to do with the variance of your inputs, uh, you will still have order one. You're making me nervous. <laughs> just kidding. I'm sorry. Did I, did I make you feel bad? I'm so sorry. I have a habit of doing that. I blame it on Jimmy Bogard. I don't know. Yeah, he makes me feel bad, and then I have to make others feel. I lash out. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, this is this is <laughs> this is constant time, and this is where we rub, rub up against people screaming and freaking out about Big O. You think about too Big O too much in the real world. So I wrote a blog post about this, and people just lost their stuff when it hit Hacker News, which was to be expected, I guess. But they said, you know, I don't care. You can't call this order n. If there's only one item in there, I only got to do one thing. And that's order one. I'm like, ah. The theory on that is, you know, okay, never mind. So it doesn't matter. But I do want to point out that if we're doing two calls across the network, it's not going to be as performant as just doing query in memory. It's just the case. But Big O says that it is. So I just want to leave that in the back of your head. You can easily fall off a cliff uh, talking about this stuff. Okay, speaking of the real world, 
the way that I, I use this stuff uh, during my day job, as I keep saying, is that I want to I want to make sure that I'm not screwing up completely. I'm not backing myself into a corner. A lot of people have told me, this is just kind of premature optimization kind of stuff. Can't you just tweak that stuff later? And I am the laziest programmer in the world. I would say, yeah, I'll do that, and I'll just forget it. Even if I, you know what, even if you put like the to-do comment, like I always feel better when I do that. You guys do that, you put to-do in your code, like I'll get back to that. I'll totally get back to that. What? Um, so things to ask yourself in the real world, is that nested loop a good idea? Usually not, usually never. If you write a nested loop, you, uh, based on inputs into an algorithm, you can almost always guarantee you're screwing yourself at some point. Uh, you can't ever depend on the fact that the, the inputs are going to be small and that's going to stay performant. Um, order n, usually if you, if you find yourself looping over data, hmm, is it the best we can do here? You sometimes can do better. Yeah, let's see. So. The big reason that I like to make sure that I focus on these things is to avoid embarrassment. And embarrassment can come in a number of ways. And I want to point out that we should all embrace the idea that we're going to fail. And, I, and I'm really a big fan of that. I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of failure. I am afraid of being embarrassed. And what I mean, I make a distinction between the two. What I mean by that is I will gladly attempt something. And if I don't know the right way to do it, I'll happily fail so I learn. But if I knew better, and I was lazy, that's embarrassing, at least to me. So in an interview, for instance, you'd, you'd want to know this stuff. We're going to talk about that in just a second. A code review with your boss, and they ask you, I don't know if that's a good idea doing that nested loop over that set. You know, yeah, you're probably right. I, should have, I left the to-do thing on there. Didn't you see it there? I said I was going to get to it. And then also public indecency, uh, where you might have an open source project, and you push some code to GitHub, and someone calls you out and says, do you know you've got factorial complexity? Whoa. Speaking of factorial complexity, <laughs> who wants to Fibonacci? <laughs> don't leave, please don't leave. <laughs> okay, I want to talk about just really an interview question really quickly because I was asked this question at Google. Uh, I went to I went to interview over there and I could not believe it. It blew me away. And I, it's, Fibonacci is a punchline. It's a cliche. It's a joke, but it's also one of the best mental puzzles. I have ever seen. I can't believe this, this, this question. So I'm assuming you all know what Fibonacci is. If you don't, please, uh, please Google it. Uh, it's just a series of numbers, and they describe organic growth. Uh, this is a list of Fibonacci numbers. The algorithm to create this list is pretty simple. Each number is the sum of the two numbers previous. So if you're asked to write an algorithm in creating Fibonacci, you could be insanely clever, do a one-line lambda like I've done here with recursion. Anybody here thinks it's a good idea? No? Anybody? Well, I mean, it looks good. I mean, kind of, I, I know recursion, right? And uh, yeah, let's dive into this. That's the next. So the first question an interviewer might ask you is, is this a good idea? And then you probably say, well, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Why not? Can you tell me why not? And, and at this point, this is when people get really grumpy about interview questions, because come on, am I really going to do Fibonacci on, the, on a daily basis? Well, no, but you really might end up writing uh, really bad recursive code. and. Um, in this case, this is the Fibonacci algorithm using uh, recursion. And the problem is right here. Because put in, in a nutshell, what you have here is a loop that branches twice each time it's called. And let's say I'm trying to look for the 20th Fibonacci number. That's what the N stands for here. I loop over. And I, you, would, you would think, do I call this 20 times? Do I call it 40 times? Maybe I'm only doing a double thing here. So it's probably just 40 calls. What's really happening? Let's say we're looking for fib 10, is you got that one call, that one call is going to branch off two more, and then two more, and then you got four, then you got eight, and then you got 64, and each time it squares. So that's what's happening with this call, and hopefully by now you should say, wait a minute, didn't we just talk about squares and binary stuff like that? Exactly. This is exponential complexity or factorial complexity. What we're doing here is our algorithm is going insane. It literally is going nuts. You can shut a machine down or a process or a thread really easily with this code. To show you what I mean, this is what a typical person who <laughs> writes this might do. They might run it a couple times and say, look, I've got zero seconds coming back. It's fast. Right? It's fast enough. I mean, it's not going to ever, like our inputs are never going to go over 20. We're no big deal. And look at Connor, you keep telling me that the scaling's going off here. What's the problem? And this is the devil in the details with exponential complexity, because check this out. In that red area right there, 
We have zero zeros. Oh, it's just climbing above zero and it's slowly starting to go up in that red area. Woo, we have a bit of an inversion right around 40, then right at 48. Are you kidding me? 300 seconds. I had no people who've written algorithmically, or excuse me, exponentially complex code. <laughs> By accident. Whoops. If you do that, you will shut your thing down hard. So how do we fix this? That's what they're going to ask you. So the first thing that an interviewer might ask you is, what's the problem? You can explain it. We have exponential complexity. It should be good enough. What's the fix? Well, this is the more traditional Fibonacci algorithm. You use an array. You just pack an array uh, up to, you just do a loop, as you can see here. You pack it up uh, with numbers that are the preceding, preceding two numbers. You sum it up, and then boom, you return the last entry in the array. Time complexity on this is, da, 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 we have one loop, it's order n. That's all you have to say to yourself. I have one loop, order n, that's all I'm really doing. The interview at this point might say, well, okay, cool. Can you do this without, can you do this without the array? I'm concerned about space complexity, or how many resources that we're using here. And this is the fun part for me. I love this stuff because it's just kind of like a programming crossword puzzle or just mental exercise. So how could you do this without the arrays? Anybody know the answer? Anybody care? I'm sure you probably do. I know you do. You can use tail recursion to do this. This is how MapReduce works, or if you use an accumulator or whatever, you just kind of, you can do recursion, you can keep passing along the value in the accumulator, and you just use those two values as I'm doing here, and the return twice plus last. They're just going to want to know, do you know what tail recursion is? Do you know how to use it? And what does it do? It saves space, blah, blah, blah. I think it's fun. OK, so that's order n. Here's one that I was actually asked, but it wasn't about Fibonacci. Can we do this faster? Does anybody know how to get order one out of a Fibonacci call? Anyone? Shout it out if you know it. No one. Yeah, maybe you're just too. Uh, hash tables. Hash tables. Well, sort of right. Yeah, actually, that's right. That'll work. You, uh, you cheat is what you do. I was asked a question about how to tell if a move in tic-tac-toe uh, was a winning move. How do you do that? I'm like, oh man. So I went through, I whiteboarded it all, and, and I felt good about it. And they said, okay, how do you do it in order one? I'm like, oh man, are you kidding me? And uh, it was funny, later on, I asked, uh, asked uh, one of the people at Google that was helping me through the interview process, I'm like, can, I, can you know the answer to that? And he just laughed at me. He's like, yeah, man, you just pre build the entire, every iteration of tic tac toe you can, including non move. I'm like, are you serious? That's such a hack. But that's exactly what you do. You just pre-build it, pre-build everything. The only way this question works, though, is if they ask you, if there's, can you put a bound on it? Let's say Fibonacci and up to, let's say, we put a cap on a million. Well, you just pre-build it all. And then you have, as he said, a hash, an order one lookup. Or you can just do the index of an array. OK, that was just a quick, painful walk through Fibonacci. But I, I think that's so useful because uh, just there's a small soapbox back here. I can't quite find it. I think Jimmy took it. But the deal with this is if you take yourself through these mental exercises, to me, you become a more valuable programmer. Because to a lot of people, they believe, as I mentioned before, they believe like, oh, we'll get to the optimization later on. And I just don't, I don't buy that. Like if you get your brain thinking about this stuff up front, like I do every day, I swear to you, uh, I know that sounds like I'm preaching. I don't mean to. but. I believe strongly that it makes you a more valuable programmer because you're going to catch problems before they become a problem. So how could that possibly be? I want to share a story with you because now I can get off my soapbox and tell you how I failed almost really badly. I faced an exponential problem years ago, and I didn't even know it was an exponential problem. My boss, uh, we, I worked in an analytic comp analytics company, and my boss said, we have all of this commerce data, and I want you to help me build this marketing thing. So I understand who's buying what. And I was like, OK. So what he was trying to build was an association between all of our product catalog based on the orders and based on views and whatnot. So it's kind of something like Amazon has, as you can see. And this is great. I love this. This is like the most random, ridiculous orders you could, or things you could find on Amazon. Like uh, this is a, we had a million random digits. Why not? There was a blog post written about the worst products you can find on Amazon. And so if people go read that blog, and they click the links. And so it built the associations in the background within Amazon. So now when you go to see the million random digits, you get to see the yodeling pickle and the Kama Putra. And this great book, I love it, How to Avoid, How to Avoid Huge Container Ships. <laughs> Whatever. This is great. I love it. 
I think that has to do with uh, something to do with Azure services. I'm not sure. What he, what he, my boss wanted, he didn't want just one association. He didn't want to land on a page and see product X and then everything associated with it. He wanted all the products associated. I want a graph, basically, is what he was telling me, a graph that looks something like this, where I have skews and edge weights that go between each thing that tells a story about which ones were bought together. All right. Well, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, I'm writing the query in my head. Uh, and I'm thinking, I can, I, can, I can probably do that. It wouldn't be too hard. I could, it's, it's now I know it's called an associative query. All I have to do is loop over the products, and then I've got to go loop over all the orders. And then every product that's in there, I can set the edge weights accordingly. An associative query. And so now my brain looks at this, and I see loop one, and I see loop two inside of it. It's a nested loop. Now we can argue about whether this is order n squared or order n times n. It doesn't really matter. It's kind of the same thing. This is a very difficult query to put into production. And I would never do it because putting order n squared into production is usually a bad idea. It will probably get you fired, like I almost did. But I kind of veered away from that. I said, I'm going to put this in an intermediate table. I'm going to take the results, and I'm going to cache them in this intermediate table. And then now I'll have these relationships. And so this is, this is uh, the fake data that I have in my fake database. But it was something like this that I gave to my boss. And he looked at that and flipped out. He literally flipped out, because he saw the relationships between product one and product two. I didn't tell him how long it took. I kind of sheepishly did. I said, you know, it took a while to mine through everything. It's like a few hours. I don't think we, need to, we should run this very often. He's like, no, no, no. We just need it once a week. It's for our weekly sales thing. And I was like, woohoo! So that was, <laughs> that was a huge victory for me. And I felt really good about that. And I was like, I could do anything at this point. And so, of course, the, my boss came and said, I want more. We just did things that are bought together. I want things that are bought in threes. I want four things that are bought together. I want to see this entire structure. I'm like, OK, I'll do it, because all I need to do is just keep going and writing nested loops, right? And uh, so I kept on trying to do that. And one day, I shut down the database server, just my personal development one. And I had to sheepishly go back and tell my boss, I, I don't know how to do this. I, I, I give up. And he said, well, we'll just hire someone who does. God. And, uh, and so they did, and that person figured something out. I don't know what they did. I think they bought Cognos or some ridiculous data tool. Had I known that this was factorial complexity, I would have been able to say, I'm not doing that. I would have been able to say, you can't do this, at least not with the, the tooling that we have. I can say that because I know it now. I know that, that this is exponential complexity, and there's no way of getting around it. Uh, you know, I could probably use a tool like Cognos and whatever, but all that's doing is just stepwise doing it and executing things, and you'll still wait for three days and still sometimes shut down your machine. This is where it gets fun for me, because having experienced all these things and understanding, wow, exponential complexity is kind of trippy. What is the nature of that problem? I mean, it's, when I tried to explain it like I'm building a graph, that didn't seem so hard, because you just have these nodes and you're building relationships between two nodes. But building a relationship between three nodes, why is that exponentially harder? And then as I was writing this book, I was like, oh, dude, that's like complexity theory. That's cool. And so that's when I started learning about complexity theory and kind of going off the deep end on it. But it's, it's actually helped me. And I'll explain why. Uh, these, the, the one up in the tree is my kid, my oldest kid. My youngest is actually here at the conference. And, I, and I, she wanted to come to the talk. And I said, you can't, because I don't have a slide with you in it. And I'll be busted. But I have a slide with your sister. Anyway, so we were in, in Santa Barbara on a trip uh, one summer, and they were bored. It was hot. And they're like, we want to do something. What can we do? And I just kind of stared at them like, what do you want to do? And they're like, we don't know. What can we do? And we kind of went back and forth on this. And this is like a problem if you and your mates want to go do something. What do you guys do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Uh, that's a really annoying problem. And just to cut right to it, it's called an optimization problem, where people want to do the best possible thing that they can do together. And you're trying to optimize combinations of things. You can, you can rephrase this as uh, you're trying to maximize fun for each person involved. In this case, maximize the fun for my kids. I want to minimize their boredom, but I'm constrained by time and location. I don't have all day. And also, the weather is going to you know, maybe be too hot. Who knows? This type of problem is called a combinatorial optimization. We face these problems every single day. 
It's weird. Once you start studying this stuff, you start to see these patterns all over the place. And uh, this is a big math word, and you can throw some complexity theory. I, I'm not going to talk too much about that, by the way. But this, it, they're NP-hard problems, which means they're, they're really difficult problems to actually solve in a reasonable amount of time. Here's another variation of that. Um, my friend Scott Hanselman has this thing with, with trying to optimize his keystrokes. I don't know if you ever read his blog or follow him on Twitter. And he's like, you only got so many words you're going to write left in your life. It's, you know, what's, you always ask yourself before you send off that email or the Twitter thing, is this the best use of my keystrokes? Of course, my brain's like, oh, mm. <laughs> don't, please, please don't have any math behind that. And of course, being Scott, of course, he dove into the math, all of it. And he figured out how long he has left to live, how many words he's probably going to write. And he came up with a number, I think it's 168 million more words. <laughs> So in his mind, he can optimize that. And so every time he sits down and, he, and he's writing an email, he's thinking, hmm, what would be the best word so I can squeeze the maximum, right? Let's put this in terms of a complexity or a complex problem. Is emailing this person back the best use of my remaining keystrokes? We can also translate to how can I optimize maximum word choice with minimum keystrokes within the constraints of this email? There turns out there's a classic problem that is exactly this. It's called knapsack. And there's a list of problems called CARPS 21 list of NP complete problems. Things like traveling salesperson, for instance. This is one of them on there, knapsack. And you would not believe how many problems we face on a daily basis. We're trying to program something and, and we're up against these optimization problems. Like if you read the definition here, you're trying to stuff the least amount of weight with the most amount of value inside of a knapsack. What is the optimal configuration? Well, the only way you can actually solve this is to put stuff in, weigh it, figure out the value, take stuff out, try a new configuration. Keep going, keep going, keep going, and then eventually you might solve the problem. Works OK for like five or six items. But if you have 100, now you're going to be there a while. Games like uh, Settlers of Catan, which my fa uh, family loves to, to play, these appear random, but they're actually variations of these problems, these combinatorial optimization problems where you're trying to optimize these things, rolls of the dice, resource users, and so on. You can take things like this, any work that we're doing, any startup that we're in, any software project we're on, we're trying to solve problems that aren't the easy ones. They're not sorting algorithms. They're not, uh, they're not things that a computer can just solve immediately. They're the hard things that take a long time to figure out. So as I mentioned, these are CARPS 21 NP complete problems. They all tend to be reducible into each other. You have things like click and bin packing, exact cover, traveling salesperson, which I'm going to talk about in a second. This very talk that I'm giving to you right now is a very, very hard problem to solve. I'm, I'm standing up here and I'm trying to optimize this talk by maximizing visual impact, minimizing your malaise and boredom, and I only have 60 minutes to do it in. So each one of those factors goes into something like a bin packing problem. So I'm bin packing this talk when I try and make it the optimal one. Is it the optimal talk? I don't know. So anyway, that's the whole nature of, of uh, these NP-complete problems. Your software project is another one. And I believe me, I'm going to come to a good conclusion here without just waving my arms. Your project team is trying to solve a problem. That in itself is a combinatorial <laughs> optimization. It's recursive. It's really trippy. You can put this, if we play spot the complexity, you can say that you're trying to optimize your project with minimal bugs. You're trying to minimize your costs. So boom, we have two things we're trying to optimize. We're trying to maximize acceptance within the constraint of a deadline. I can tell you that this is exponentially complex. I can prove that to you mathematically, which to me is exciting and interesting. You can reduce a software problem to traveling salesperson. Right, and hopefully you guys have heard of this. It's where a salesperson has to go from one city to the other city to the other city, never going to the same city twice. And they have to go all around all to all cities, but they have to do it at the least possible cost. Now, it's a tough problem. And you can kind of think of software projects that way if you think about deliverables over time, and you don't ever want to do the same thing twice. Right? If you do, you break the rules. These are not impossible to solve. And I really want you to understand that. I'm not trying to stand up here saying, oh, these are just crazy. Don't ever try. You can try. You can use a brute force algorithm. What is a brute force algorithm? Well, if you've ever gone through an interview and you've had to dedupe an array, you know that you can brute force it with a nested loop. There are more elegant solutions. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. 
But brute forcing traveling salesperson basically involves going from one node to the next based on what's the cheapest thing I can get to, what's the cheapest city I can get to next. I'll go there. And you go there, and then you brute force it again, and you say, well, uh, I'm sorry, I'm saying, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. To brute force this, back up, erase what I just said last 10 seconds. To brute force this, you go to every single city. And then you just calculate, after you've gone to every single one, to every single com uh, combination, which one's the cheapest. That is exponentially complex. The thing I started to say that I got ahead of myself on was you can use what's called an approximation or a heuristic. This is what we do every single day when it's just too hard to think about something. When all you and your mates want to go out for a coffee or a beer or whatever, and you're like, I don't know, I know that I went to this, this, uh, this bar last week and it was a lot of fun, and your friend says, oh yeah, let's go there. The two of you want to do it. That pulls the rest of the group and out the door you go. That's a heuristic that we use every single day. A nearest neighbor works the same way as I started to explain. You start at city A, and you look around and say, where's the next cheapest one I can go to? And you go there. And then you, at that point, what's the next cheapest one I can go to? And so on. Your project team, if you follow Agile, does exactly this. Your project team at any given iteration is going to look at the parameters that you know at a given time and, it's going to, and you're going to evaluate what's going on. What is, the, what is the next set of things that we can do in the, in the uh, nearest amount of time that is going to bring us down or uh, deliver the software on time? And then you say, okay, that's our next iteration, that's what we're going to do. And eventually you're going to end up at a solution. And eventually you're going to end up with something that you can give to uh, your client. This type of approach, a greedy algorithm uh, to traveling salesmen, will get you within, this is mathematically proven, will get you to within 75% of the optimal answer, always. And that to me is fascinating. Because you can go to your boss and say, dude, if we do Agile, we do Agile, we'll be 75% within the optimal solution. There it is, you got math on your side. I think math's pretty good. Of course, I mean, that's not the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation is, the goal is going to change, right? And we'll, we'll deliver something. And that's the way Agile kind of is supposed to work. You deliver something, you manage expectations, and you eventually get there. But it is more efficient than doing the alternative, which is waterfall. So you can go and tell your boss that maybe you want to be an Agile team because I'm a certified Scrum Master. Thank you very much. I'm not a certified Scrum Master. I'm just kidding. I'm trying to wake you up. Sorry. OK, speaking of waking you up, that's it for me. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you coming. Um, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>